thank you for letting us in. We are the Haunted Heart, two best friends joined together by a twisted fascination with magic, madness, and the macabre. Join us on our journey, where we are sometimes deep. Some... What? Did the music just cut out? Oh, shit. I can't hear it, Kenny. Is it... I can't hear it either. <sighs> Did you not get a clip that was long enough for the promo? Oh, God. Oh, you know what? You know what? Fuck it. We're trash talent. That's a fair point. This is a podcast for people who like trash. And we are trash. And we like to talk about all things macabre, witchy, true crime, and anything else our little haunted hearts fancy. So join us for new episodes every Wednesday. Tune in to the Haunted Heart wherever you listen to podcasts. And, and as, as always, always stay, stay spooky. spooky. I'm Donna. And I'm Carrie. And we are Paranormal Chicks. Episode 6. And that promo y'all just heard? Yeah. Is from the Haunted Heart Podcast. <laughs> Katie and Kenny. That's right. We love them. I know. They're so awesome. They're so funny. Yes. They're just like us. BFFs. Yeah. They love the weird shit. They love the paranormal. Mm-hmm. They love the true crime. Yep. They love the macabre. Yep. You might have heard that because <laughs> it's in their promo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. You know, we like to reiterate things. Yes, and they release every Wednesday. So then you can get us on Mondays, them on Wednesdays, spread it out throughout your week. That's right. And then you get payday on Friday usually. I mean, could it be any better than that? Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Sign me up. So head on over to iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever else you get your podcasts, just like you do for us, and check them out because they're awesome. And if you like to get spooky, they like to get spookier. Um, Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what else do you say? They're spooky. They're awesome. Check them out. They're spooky. We're kooky. Oh, God. We have dad jokes. <laughs> and dad pods. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's funny. So big stuff happening this week. For real. One, Bill Cosby, guilty. Thank God. I know. That is so hard for me to like accept that he's guilty like i'm very glad that he was found guilty and i mean he did it just him doing it is hard for me to accept yeah you know just because his jokes remind me of my dad's jokes and yeah you know you want to believe that he is who he was on the cosby show and on the jello commercials and the kids say the darndest things and that's what i mean it's hard to accept i mean he guilty <laughs> i posted this in the um closed facebook group that he like lost his shit a little bit because i think he really probably thought he was going to get off like oh for sure like he was like i got money i got good attorneys um america's dad but then when he was convicted or when he you know when he was found guilty they the prosecutor was like okay well we want you to revoke his bail now because he's got a plane right and he was like it doesn't matter if i have a plane asshole <laughs> that's how i picture him saying it oh, okay. but that is what he said and so it's just like damn he like you know it's like you can like feel his panic in his words you know yeah but anyway okay your thing of what happened big this week and no one besides you understood well i mean the online community did, yeah but like irl people yeah. only you <laughs> IRL means in real life for those of you who did not grow up using AOL Instant Messenger. Like, what were you doing with your life? Um, I don't know, because I was. <laughs> yes, you had to craft the perfect away message. Oh my gosh, with the perfect background color. Of course. The perfect font color mm -hmm. and the perfect saying. And if you were really awesome, you would have capital letter, lowercase, capital uh, letter, lowercase. Yeah, case. with the tilde sign, yes. tilde, 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 and whatever, the approximately <laughs> sign. <laughs> I just called it tilde. That sounds right. Yeah. But I mean, I could be churching it up with the A <laughs> at the end. It's right like tilde. And I'm like, tilde. Cut that out. No. <laughs> okay. So what got me real hype was that the East Area Rapist slash Golden State Killer slash Original Night Stalker. Mm -hmm. He is 
in the clinker. Yes. And you know what, though? They had mm-hmm. old man him. <laughs> yeah. Um, And one of the sketches uh, beside each other. And it's like, whoa, that's actually really, really close. On. Yeah. It's like, oh, my gosh. That's really cool. Yeah. I feel like that's if someone found out who killed John Benet Ramsey. Like, yeah. that's, I would be like, oh, my gosh. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because yeah. that was like more of our time than yeah. him. But could I say yeah again? I always, though, get his story confused because he has so many names. Well, you know what? Add one more name to that. And that is Convict. Oh, another thing that happened this week, and it was just today, I got my eyes checked. Yeah, and she has on contacts today for the <laughs> first time in like I don't know, three years. Mm-hmm. And so she looks so different because she doesn't have on like her dark rimmed glasses that yeah. are, you know, like a, like statement glasses, not just like whatever. Anyway, <laughs> you look so different. Like I'm like, is she getting ready for bed? <laughs> <laughs> I'm Superman. I got rid of my Clark Kent. Oh, uh. okay. This is your podcasting look. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I got my eyes dilated and probably not the smartest decision to do it uh, because, you know, it's not like I have to read anything or anything, right? Meanwhile, she drove home. I know. (laughs) But in her defense, they did tell her at the thing that she didn't need to get a ride. Yeah. That she could drive home. Which it was okay. I mean, you didn't die. Right. Current events. Check. Glasses. Uncheck. Contacts. Check. Mic one. Check. Check. (laughs) (laughs) oh my god that was great so all right so you go first today i'm so excited okay picture it sicily no crosby texas close enough shout Mm -hmm. out houston area (laughs) that's right yep carrie used to live there well not in crosby in houston but (laughs) yeah close enough yeah i lived there for a year because i had to follow carrie you came like four years after i moved there (laughs) i know i couldn't deal with her away anymore because I'm psycho. I was going to say. Uh, <laughs> it was a little creepy. No. Whatever. Uh, it was fun. creepy because we had a crazy landlord. landlord. I mean, first day was bad. He had Carrie in tears. Which you know I'm pissed if I'm crying. Yeah. And he had me talking at his house. With no air on. No air. In, in Houston. tiny ass fucking chairs. Oh my God. Not a big girl friendly house. <laughs> And they were all like really artsy looking stuff. And I'm like, I'm about to break this $5,000 chair. <laughs> I'm about to show you how that bitch. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and he was holding my hands. Like, you know, when you play that it's slap like hand game? games? Yeah. yeah. Um, he was holding my hand like that. And he was talking <laughs> that we could be friends in another galaxy. Because he was mad at me because I said, hey, there's road shit everywhere. Can you take that out of our deposit? Because yes. we got to get an exterminator. <laughs> Yeah, and so he was pissed, and he really only dealt with me for a long time. He was he hated me because I was like, the house is a disaster. Oh, it was. There's road shit everywhere. <laughs> I'm taking half of my deposit out. Oh, that was so bad. Yeah, it was bad. He did in the end come around because Donna had to move back unexpectedly because her sister was sick, and so I was just in the house by myself. For a couple of months until the lease was up. So when I moved out, I came back to get like the last few things and to clean the house. And he was like, no, don't worry about cleaning. Like, here's your deposit. Don't worry about it. I got it. And I was like, are you sure? And he's like, yeah, you saw how the house was when y'all moved in. I'll, I'll take care of it. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. And he gave me back my full pet deposit. Because he loved Marley. Oh, he did. I mean, everybody does. She's so frou-frou. I know. She's amazing. There's a Crosby, Mississippi, too. Really? My um grandpa used to own a uh, diner there. Diners, oh. drive-ins, and dives. Um, but it really was. Oh, my uh, God. Bringing it back to Guy Fieri. Fieri? Fieri. I don't yeah. know. I think it depends on if he, when he, if he's fancy. <laughs> like, if you knew him before a show, he was Fieri. If you knew him after the show, he's Fieri. <laughs> <laughs> when he's got his white tips up, he's Fieri. <laughs> <laughs> That's his version of Clark Kent. <laughs> He puts a flame shirt on. <laughs> it's business puts time. Puts the top down in the car. That's right. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay. For on the real, though, Papa owned a um, diner, a gas station, and a hotel Oh, in that's right. When they moved here, he bought the one here. Cool. Okay. Crosby, Texas. Yeah. We're taking it back to the 1980s. Ooh, your least favorite time of the century. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Besides that, I was born then, but you but know. But you hate 80s movies. Yeah. You don't like 80s music. You don't like 80s movies. True, true. I hate you don't it. like 80s parties? No. My hair does not go big enough. 
Okay, so 1980s, it was a new subdivision called Newport. Richie? No. Newport Richie? Never heard of that in my life. <laughs> it's a place uh, south of Tampa, like by St. Pete in Florida. Oh. And that was my stomping grounds for grad school. That's why I know. Well, never heard of that before, but now I'm educated. You're welcome. So now when I play Jeopardy, I'm going to fucking dominate. So thank you, Carrie. You're welcome. Okay, sorry. They're modest homes with immortal tenants. Dun, dun, dun. That's right. Thank you for the sound effects. You're welcome. Sam and Judith Haney, they purchased a lot in Section 8, which would be on the street Poppet's Way. Poppet's Way? Would you like some crumpets? <laughs> that's like exactly what I thought about when I said it. <laughs> Sorry for everyone in the UK that's like, holy shit, that was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so it was a completely empty lot, and so then they built their house. It was going to be their forever home, but it needed one thing, a swimming pool. abs freaking lutely Everyone needs one. Mm-hmm. Everyone wants one, unless you don't. Oh, like those people on those remodel shows that they fill in a swimming pool. I'm like, have you lost your mind? I know. I don't understand I it. don't get it either. Like, put a fence around it if you have a kid. How I picture this is that he has like a backhoe and all this equipment and they're about to break ground. Yeah. Well, they hear a knock, knock, knock at the door and it's this elderly black man. And he's like, look, you don't want to do what you're about to do. And Sam's like, Manny, say what? (laughs) So he's like, there's two graves where you're going to put that pole. Oh, my gosh. Mm -hmm. And Sam's like, uh, okay. Like, one, who are you? Two, how do you know that? Three, I want to swim in the deep end. (laughs) You know? So Jasper Norton is like, look, I know they're there because I dug those. The graves? Mm Mm-hmm. Yep. Because he's like 80. Okay. Now. And he was 13 when he dug those graves. Oh, my God. Yeah. So Sam was like, okay, so there's just two graves in this field. Like, why weren't we notified kind of thing? Yeah. Well, apparently, it was a whole cemetery in their Section 8. Oh, my gosh. A whole cemetery, and it was called Black Hope. It was an old 19th century African-American slave cemetery. Oh, God. Yeah. So, it was originally owned by the McKinney family, and they had a plantation there. And they oh, of the Crosby McKinney's? Yep. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Okay, Titanic. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so they gave a portion of their land to their freed slaves. They built a church, a school, some homes, and that cemetery. Oh. Yep, so it was a Black Hope community, and it was around for decades until it was destroyed by a fire. I couldn't find a lot about the fire, but I'm thinking the last graves that were dug were in 1939. So if you think it was around for a a few decades, that would put it 1960s, so civil rights. It might have been burnt because of that. Maybe. Allegedly. (laughs) But, like, why was the last grave dug in 39 if it continued on for two more decades? I don't know. Maybe it was full, you know? I mean, it was just a piece of land. So Sam was like, all right, we're either going to have a pool or we're going to find some bodies. They dug. They found bodies. Oh, God. It was two pine boxes. Oh, Mm -hmm. And the skeletons in there had their wedding bands on. (gasps) Oh, my gosh. So when they found the skeletons, they called the county coroner to exhume the bodies. They determined through research that the two deceased were Betty and Charles Thomas, and they were slaves that were freed after the Civil War. So Judith was really uncomfortable because they had dug these graves up and disturbed them. They tried to look for their family, couldn't find any. So she's like, all right, let's rebury them, but we'll put flowers over their grave. And let them rest in peace. But they did not rest in peace. (gasps) Strange things started to happen. Oh, my gosh. The first thing that really started to happen was that there was a clock in their bedroom. And it would start glowing and sparking, but it was unplugged. What? So she thought she heard Sam's voice one time when she heard the sliding glass door open. Mm Mm-hmm. And she thought he said, what are you doing? So she answered and she didn't hear anything. So she got back up. No one was there. Oh, God. Yes. Um. One night after she had thought she heard someone, 
The next day, she woke up and she was looking for one pair of shoes that she wanted to wear. But okay, so she looked everywhere, could not find them. They were going to work and uh, Sam was like, Judy? Because I'm sure he called her Judy. What was her name? Judith. Oh. (laughs) Oh my goodness. (laughs) Remember Sam, Judith, Jasper. Jasper. Jasper's the only one I remember. Oh my gosh. Okay, so he was like, Judy. And on the grave where they had buried the flowers, right beside it, her shoes no, were right beside it, like neatly there. Uh-uh. Come to find out, Mm-mm. that day was Betty's birthday. <gasps> so it's like... She was getting dressed. Okay, no. Oh. <laughs> it was a gift. Yes. <laughs> Behind door number two. <laughs> Well, I was like, she was like getting dressed to like go out on the town. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. And here's when you know you're single. You don't think about <laughs> gifts. <laughs> like it didn't even cross my mind until you were like, no. And I was like, oh. <laughs> Again, Carrie is single looking to mingle. <laughs> Okay, so Judas said that was the start of her emotional state being terrible. She was crying all the time, and she was super stressed out. I mean, can you imagine not getting a night's sleep, having weird things happening, you know? So she said she felt like her life was unraveling. Bless it. The activity became so frightening in the house that they wanted to move out, but they couldn't afford to. Yeah, because if that was their forever home, they probably sunk all their money in it. Yeah, and it was like a brand new build, you know, built to their specifications. Bless it. So they actually sued the developers for not informing them about the cemetery. Yeah. Because who would buy property that a cemetery was built on top of, you know? Right. It's like 60 people were in that cemetery. Oh, my God. At least. Holy crap. And it's all in this Section 8. However, they eventually lost the case. (gasps) What? Yeah. And they had to declare bankruptcy because they owed $50,000 in court fees. Oh, my gosh. Isn't that terrible? You lose your forever home. You lose, you know, your financial stability. So they ended up moving in with some family. And while they were having all of this issues, nope, all of these issues, a dozen of their neighbors reported lights and televisions going on and off at random times. They also heard disembodied voices (gasps) and several people reported seeing apparitions. Oh my gosh. So it's very active in this location. Did it say if there was any activity before or did it all start when they dug up those two graves? I think it started then, but I think they were one of the first people in In their house and stuff. So they kind of were the catalyst for it. So they're they're moved off, but we're going to focus on another family now. It's Ben and Jean Williams. This was actually happening around the same time as the Haney's. So same year. Yeah. So picture it. 1980s, <laughs> Crosby, Texas, Newport subdivision. Section 8? Yep. Gotcha. What's the street name? Puppet's Way. <laughs> I didn't remember Judy's name, but I remember Puppet's Way. <laughs> oh, okay. So they reported near their flower beds that there would be sinkholes in the shape of coffins. <gasps> Yes. And like, so they fill them up with dirt and stuff and it would happen yet again. Oh, hell no. Mm -hmm. Jean said that all the flowers that they would plant would die. Nothing would grow. Nothing would last more than a few days. Damn, it's like if I planted them. Right? Y'all, she killed an aloe vera plant. I really did. True story. I killed it with my love. What movie? (laughs) Only he said he killed them with their love, but... (laughs) Whatevs. Uh, I know. Because my mom read it to me as a kid. God, she read you some (laughs) crazy shit. It's the Green Mile, by the way. Yeah. Um, I never even said about the paranormal side. I always said stuff about the true crime about my mom. Mm-hmm. But she used to read Goosebumps and Stephen King and stuff to me and my brother when we would go to sleep. Yeah. Hence me saying she read y'all some crazy shit. Yes. She turned me into the weirdo, creepy person I am today. I mean, meanwhile, you were like five years old laying in there listening to her read you that crap. Yeah. That's how I learned to read. She probably was like... I want to read this book. So, hey, kids, you want yeah. to hear this story? <laughs> yes. Oh, my God. She made up this uh, scary story for us. And the the people, the little boys' names were Heapy and Jeepy. 
<laughs> and one time, like, she was so tired and I made her tell it, you know, like, all the time. Mm-hmm. So I knew it. I just wanted mm-hmm. her to tell me. Um, Isn't that how we were with every single story that she told? Yes. Oh, my gosh. If my mom was still here, she would be on this podcast and uh, y'all would be cracking up. Yes. <laughs> but uh, she was like trying to go to sleep and she started telling the story and then suddenly Scooby-Doo was in the <laughs> story and I was like I'm surprised not the Flintstones <laughs> no I would have liked that I, that's what I know <laughs> but I was like um, Scooby-Doo's not in this story <laughs> like this is what happens and she's like well you tell me and then I'm like okay <laughs> yeah and she went to sleep and I was still up <laughs> imagine that <laughs> Always a night owl. Never a morning person. Never. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, sorry. Woo, tangent. Tangent. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, God. Okay. They also said that violent storms would occur over their house when the sun was out just a short distance away. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And would come out of nowhere. You know, no storms. Yeah. Yeah. And it would bring out poisonous snakes. (gasps) Uh -uh, Uh-uh. Uh-uh. I don't do snakes. No, thank you. Mm -mm. Another thing that happened to the Williams, their pets would die or would run off. Because animals know what's up. Oh, for sure. Uh, One time their cat came back from being in the woods for a little bit and gave birth to horribly deformed (gasps) kittens. No. Yeah. First of all, I hate cats. But second of all, cats for real know what's up when it comes to spirits and stuff. Like I feel like more than dogs. Yeah, for sure. Here's something. So they had hamsters and they went crazy. That a hamster did? Yeah. I all I can picture is like him going on that wheel, the wheel. Yeah. Or being stuck in like one of the plastic balls tubes? or whatever. Oh. Yeah, the tubes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh. Now I have from Willy Wonka, the guy who's eating the river chocolate mm-hmm. gets uh, stuck. Augustus. Augustus Gloop. He's a glib. That's what I know. Stop being so glib. <laughs> Okay, so here's something I thought that was extra creepy. There were some birds that nested at their house. That's all you got to say, birds. I don't like them. Right? But these birds pecked out their, <gasps> like, pecked their young to death. <gasps> yes. Ew. I know. <laughs> Marley just looked up at me like, <laughs> why so glum? Glib. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. The couple also saw shadows move along the walls. Those shadows were accompanied by whispers and putrid smells. Ew. Here's where it gets a little crazier. Are you ready? Ready. Okay. So they had their granddaughter, Carly, living with them. Mm Mm-hmm. And she felt intense cold spots during hot summer where, yeah, it'd be cool inside, but then like chill to the bone. Like winter cold. She also said that the toilets would flush all the time in the Williams house. Like by themselves? Mm Mm-hmm. And usually when they were walking down the hall. Well, Carly, their granddaughter, said that she could hear voices when the toilets were flushing. It sounded like four people were having a conversation. Oh, God. Yeah, and only when the toilets were flushing. And then she started to experience some dreams that might be called death premonition. So what she would do, she would dream of a long staircase descending into the fog. If she saw a person walk down the stairs in her dream, they would often die (gasps) in real life. IRL. Oh my gosh. Yeah, how crazy. Within months, six of their close relatives were diagnosed with cancer and three of them died. (gasps) They felt that the illnesses were caused by the spirits in the home. Wait, so did the people who got cancer live there? No, they would visit. Oh, okay. Like, they would be fine, they'd visit. And then they'd get cancer. And then they'd have cancer. People that would come over, like their kids and stuff, would instantly fight when they got into their house. It was just like... Like a heavy... Yeah. Yeah. Um... Oh, something else that was crazy about Carly, their granddaughter, Mm -hmm. the street lamp in front of their house would blink in answer to the granddaughter's questions. What? Yes. Oh, about them having a fight and stuff when they were over at their house. All three of their marriages, the children's. Mm Mm-hmm. Ended in divorce. And then it said five other family members died. But again. They didn't live in the house, but it's after visits to the house. Okay. I mean, I know. I'm just stating what the thing said. So one time, Ben, he was coming home from work in the kitchen getting some orange juice. Sounds just like this a story from the Sally house. Right? God, you are paying attention to me. You do love me. I... Uh, But okay, so he's getting some orange juice and he sees 
two black figures. And he said it was dark, but they were obviously figures. Yeah. Walked down the hall towards their master bedroom. The figures did? Uh Uh-huh. And Uh -uh. he's like, fuck no. Yeah. Like, they're going to my wife. This shit ain't cool. Yeah. (laughs) So he puts down the OJ like... Fuck this shit. Sprints down the hallway and he flings open the door. They're in the room <gasps> and he goes through them and like leaps on his wife and says, gotcha. No. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> no, but he said that he felt them go through him. <gasps> like it felt like spider webs. Oh God. Him. Yes. But what were they doing? I don't know. He- like, why were they going towards the wife? I need to know. They might have needed some shoes, too. But isn't that creepy? I cannot even... Like, could you imagine? Mm-mm. I would not have the fight then. I'd been like, so long, wife. See you later. <laughs> <laughs> we can bury you in the cemetery out back. Meanwhile, the wife was probably, like, taking a nap and like, what the fuck? When, like, she woke up to, like, her husband jumping right? on her. She's like, not right now, Ben. <laughs> Come. <laughs> Did you take that blue pill? <laughs> <laughs> I have a headache. <laughs> oh, God. She says, but I have two hands. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so like they learn the same way, kind of how the Haynes did. Old Jasper Norton is like, hey, do you see this tree right here? This oak tree. And it had it had two horizontal slash marks mm-hmm. and an arrow that pointed towards the ground. And that tree was marked because there were two graves beneath it. Oh. It was sisters. Oh. Yes. So, God, just so scary to think like they probably saw that and were like, oh, some little kid yeah. drew this or, yeah. you know, whatever. And... I mean, well, maybe it was a kid who drew it, but... Well, hell, if he was digging the graves at 13, he probably was. Yeah, but it's like, it's just so scary to think about the things that we think are so minute Mm -hmm. are actually so big. Yeah. That was very poetic. Thank you. I have my moments. You're deep right then. (laughs) Uh, Meanwhile, I was thinking, like, two hands deep. (laughs) (laughs) Damn. I mean, what can I say? A girl knows what she likes. (laughs) Um... Okay, back to the creepy shit. Um, because all that wasn't creepy. <laughs> right? Okay, so the Williams also took legal action. They were informed by the developers without bodies, they had no proof that it was also on their land. Well, but now, you know, they had Jasper mm-hmm, that said there's two graves right there. So, uh, Jean was frustrated because... All this shit's going on. Yeah. You know, her granddaughter is greatly affected by it. So Jean started to dig. She became ill (gasps) digging. And so then her daughter, who was like, I saw some things that say 29 and then some that say 31. So somewhere in that range. Somewhere. You know, women like to not disclose their real age. So who knows? (laughs) Um, But her name was Tina. So she took over. About half an hour, she became ill. (gasps) And the last thing that Tina was saying was, Mommy, take care of my baby. Take <gasps> care of my baby. And she looked so scared. That's what Jean said. They rushed Tina to the hospital where she died from a heart attack. <gasps> they say that the ambulances had a hard time finding the house and actually got lost going out of the subdivision, even though it's not a hard place. Yeah. It was just kind of like something yeah. was, you know, making Amiss. that happen. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. I put in my notes, it was as if the spirits were fucking with them. (laughs) (laughs) Again, I can write your term paper. (laughs) Um, Jean took it really hard because she felt like her death was a direct result of them digging. Yeah. Digging. And it was because she was frustrated, you know, all of this. So they fled to Montana and allowed their home on Poppet's Way to go back to the lender. Yeah. By the time that they left, seven of the eight original houses had been abandoned. (gasps) The eighth house, which belonged to the Haney's, would eventually be abandoned, too. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So nothing too unusual has happened, but there have been some occurrences. Most of the graves have been moved. One resident, Joe Clark, one time my mother, my friend, and I were in the house and the bedroom door slammed shut. I told them that it was either a draft or the wind. I don't think it's anything, but to this day, my mother won't stay past dark. Oh my gosh. Yeah. P.S. That started out like a joke. 
My mother and my friend and I walked into a bar. <laughs> it was no laughing matter. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Kim, who is Joe's wife, she said, the only thing that's ever happened to me over the years is that one time I felt a definite presence of a hand, but there was no one there. Uh Uh-oh. I'm like, yeah, okay, that's the only thing that happened, but still, that's creepy as fuck. Right. Not like move out of the house creepy. Yeah. But creepy, creepy. So, like, people live in the houses now, obviously. Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, Lord. So Joe Clark's mother, Jan, who won't go to that house after dark, uh, she reported an incident where her and her grandson saw a black orb, and she said it was about the size of a quarter, floating in the room and across the television set. Oh, my gosh. And she said, quote, I don't tell stories unless they're true. When that door slammed shut, there was no wind, no fan, and the window wasn't open. And then another time, she said that she had went to the bathroom with her granddaughter, Taylor. Then Taylor left the bathroom, leaving her alone. And she said something like a man's voice breathed real heavy, real close to her. Mm -mm. She said she got out of there real quick. And to this day, she does not go back into that bathroom. Uh Uh-uh. No. She said also, Taylor who was three years old, said, Mama, I saw that brown man and he tried to pick me up. (gasps) Like, what? Oh, my gosh. And it's just so, like, both of their granddaughters. Yes. I was going to say, it's like they are drawn to the kids or something. Yes. Another neighbor, Vina Luna, who lives on the original graveyard plot, reported coming home one night several weeks after moving into their house. She found it strange that both her husband and her dog were looking straight ahead at the television. It would not acknowledge her presence when she went in what yeah and then she said two weeks later her husband finally told her what happened he said that when he came in the dog was in the back corner of the house hovering in a corner when he went to check on the dog he bent over to pick up his slippers and they flew across the room what Yes. And he said the reason they hadn't looked at her is because they were both still so afraid. Like, they were both just, like, zoned out. Yeah. Like, don't look. Nobody's here. Nobody move. (laughs) Yeah. Like, uh uh-uh. Don't say anything. Didn't see anything. Yeah. Whatever. Feed me dinner. That's it. Um, Luna explained that she stays home to take care of her grandmother, Marie Langwell. And she has recently developed Alzheimer's. Mm Mm-hmm. And this is what Luna said. Grandma always says that there's a dark lady that comes to her and she doesn't know why. Then sometimes she says that there are children in her room and she can't sleep because they're keeping her awake. And this article that I got said, Langwell didn't bat an eye. She said, oh, yes, I talk to them all the time. I won't let them get anything over on me. They will if I let them. Hmm. Like, that just yeah. sounds like, yeah. you know, an old grandma. Yeah. Um, she said, uh, sometimes they ask me, where are you going? And I say, I'm going to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god that's cute i know i was like oh i love this lady that's all i could find a lot of stuff but not near like coffin sinkholes yeah, yeah. And- well and the thing is too is that like all the stuff that you're talking about could be explained away. The daughter that died of the heart attack. She's digging a hole. So it stands to reason that she would have, if she's going to have a heart attack, that would be the time that she had it, yeah. you know, working hard. And then with the little old grandma with Alzheimer's, you know, hallucinations are a side effect of Alzheimer's. And yeah. so it's like, is she just hallucinating or is it actually, you know, someone coming to right. see her? So it's like, you know, you can yeah. you can reason it away. But on the other hand, is it really the ghost? Right. The Haney and the Williams stories were both shared on Unsolved Mysteries in <gasps> July of 2002. Unsolved Mysteries was still around in 2002? Apparently so. I loved that show. <laughs> also, something I thought was really cool is that there are a lot of online articles claiming that the events on Poppet's Way inspired the film Poltergeist. Really? Yep. And so I looked up what a poltergeist means, and it's a German word for noisy ghost or noisy spirit. Um, it's a type of ghost or spirit that's responsible for physical disturbances such as loud noises and objects being moved or destroyed. Hmm. Hence the shoes, the slippers. Yeah. Wow. Think about it. The blinking yeah. of the street light and stuff. That's so poltergeist. Yeah, absolutely. There you wow. go. Wow. That was good. How crazy, though, like you lived in Houston and just right up the street. Mm-hmm. And you didn't know about Crosby, Texas, the sweet little Newport subdivision with modest homes and immortal tenants. Okay, so we just took a break 
And I for I remembered a long time ago, it was me and Marley on the couch and my mom was in like her seat in the living room Mm -hmm. and Marley was laying beside me and one of her balls were, nope, was uh, (laughs) grammar. I know it. Um, But it was like between us and we had been like throwing it and stuff, but Mm -hmm. she was asleep. My mom was like dozing off, yeah, you know, and I was just watching TV. All of a sudden the ball flew across the room (gasps) and i was like oh my gosh yeah marley didn't move yeah i didn't like flick it with my foot and my mom was like no i saw that (gasps) you know what i bet it was andy i thought so oh my gosh okay that leads me to another story okay i mean i know which you know this yeah (laughs) but so okay when my nephew who's now six Mm -hmm. nope 17 he was born in 2000 i should not have to worry about what age he is (sighs) anyway so he was young we had two oversized chairs in the living room and they both had ottomans well under the one that my mom always sat in because we're creatures of habit right my nephew he would say that there was a little boy underneath there and so we'd egg him along and be like well what's his name and he said andy we thought it was a joke because toy story was popular at the time yeah but uh so you know whatever and so he said that the boy was black with red eyes and he had remember that part really no i just remember it being andy yeah no he said black (gasps) with red eyes but he he had a vivid imagination. He was a kid that only answered to Danny Zuko. Yes. <laughs> I mean, he was very imaginative. Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, like, ha, 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 whatever. Just how he would say it. He was like, oh, Andy's there. Well, one day, me and my mom got a wild hair and we were like, hey, you've been sitting in this chair for like a year. Let's switch it around so, you know, it doesn't like mold to your ass. Yeah. <laughs> so we did. And I was sitting in her old seat and he came over. And again, they were identical. And he was like, y'all. I'll switch chairs and we were like how did you know and he said because andy's on underneath that one now oh god and it was the one i was sitting in and i was like legs up uh-uh. jump over the ottoman and mm-hmm. i'm back on the couch uh-uh what the fuck yes identical chairs there were no different right the only no he andy was under the one chair yes and that chair moved, ergo, <laughs> Andy moved. So freaking crazy. But like when you ask him about Andy now, he won't talk about him. Yeah. Like almost like pretends like he doesn't remember, but he clearly remembers and he'll yes. be like, no, I don't talk about him. Ooh. Anyway, so enough of the scariness because I got to, you know, live here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. On to the really scary part. On to the there's no denying this is real yes. story. Yes. Okay. So I am doing BTK. Ooh, BTW, I love him. (laughs) (laughs) BTK was probably one of the first serial killers that, like, I remembered. I mean, not like, hey, I remembered this happening. Like, that just, like, when I kind of got into true crime, that he was one of the first ones that I remembered his name and his story and, you know, all that. Because you know how I am with names. Um, Clearly from my story earlier. True. I remember obscure things, though. Yeah. So, BTK, do you know what it stands for? Um, no. Bind, torture, kill. Ooh, Mm -hmm. BDSM. Only no safe word. (laughs) Fifty Shades of Dead. (laughs) Fifty Shades of (laughs) Decomp. Oh, (laughs) God. All right, so let's back up a little bit. Let me guess. He had a tortured childhood. Nope. What? Mm Mm-hmm. I am just throwing a fucking curveball, throwing a wrench in the formula for a serial killer. When I thought I had you pegged, I brought out Dennis Lynn Raider. Um, okay. <laughs> I must really have a dirty fucking mind because when I said I had you pegged and then, and then you <laughs> said I brought out D- D- and I was like, <laughs> damn, you pegged me. <laughs> Dennis Lynn Raider was born March 9th, 1945 uh, in Pittsburgh, Kansas, and he grew up in Wichita. So he was the oldest of four kids and had a normal childhood. But some reports say that he would kill stray animals by hanging. Golly. I know. So normal childhood, went to college, but he dropped out of college to join the Air Force in the mid-1960s. Then he, after he got out of the Air Force, he went, he moved back to Wichita And he married his wife, Paula, back in 1971. In 1974 is when he got his job with ADT Security. 
Oh, Lord. <laughs> BTW while you're doing BTK. Uh-huh. I'm going to make that joke a lot. A lot. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's never funny, but oh, I well. laugh. Well, it says a lot if you laugh at me because you're a tough crowd sometimes. Um, Have you heard how I like spend this whole podcast cracking up? I know, but sometimes when I think I'm really funny. I look at you and you can hear crickets. Yes. When I wanted to do for Bloody Mary to say that she was the one direction of urban legends. She's mm-hmm. really hip with the preteens. You were like, yeah. <laughs> well, it was funny to me when I wrote it in my term paper. <laughs> I mean, I don't. Okay. <laughs> That's so funny. One direction. <laughs> Oh, good. I'm such a bitch. Sorry. Oh, anyway, um, <laughs> what was I saying, though? Oh, um... BTW, BTK. ADT. Uh, Tiffany's brother, I think, used to work for ADT back in the day. Maybe they knew each other. Oh, my God. Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon. <laughs> 98. Nick Lachey. <laughs> we like word association. <laughs> <laughs> that make no sense. <laughs> so, OBS, Dennis Rader, is BTK. On January 15th of 1974, Dennis Rader entered the home of Joseph and Julie Otero. So he selected and targeted these people because he was attracted to their 11-year-old daughter, jo- mm-hmm. Josephine. You nasty motherfucker. Right? I know. When So he, when he entered the home, he was caught by surprise because the dad, Joseph, wasn't supposed to be there. It was supposed to just be the mom and the kids. Oh. Yeah. I couldn't find anywhere about how he killed Joseph first because, you know, he was trying to get control of the situation because he didn't think he was going to be there. I couldn't find anything about how he killed him. But Julie, the mom, um, he strangled her. And this was all while nine-year-old Joseph Jr. watched. Oh, my God. Yes. So after he killed the parents, he dragged Joseph Jr. into his room. Oh, my God. Wrapped two T-shirts around his head and covered that with a plastic bag. (gasps) Then he pulled up a chair and just watched as the boy struggled on the bed and rolled on the floor where he died. What the fuck? Mm -hmm. Then, while he was killing the son, though, he later goes on to say, later when he's caught... Later, later, later. God, how many times did I say that? Anyway, he says that he was not prepared for how hard it would be to actually strangle someone to death. So the first time that he strangled Julie, she didn't die. So she like staggered kind of back in there to try to help her son. Oh, my God. And so he had to strangle her again. So then he later he says to the investigators after he's caught that that's when he prepared for his quote, encore killing of Josephine. Oh, my gosh. This is so Why do you have to kill her? Because he was obsessed with her. I know, but... I mean, the alternative is not any better. The I know. So he took Josephine to the basement, removed all of her clothing. Oh, my gosh. Mm Mm-hmm. I know. Um, was just being nasty with her, rubbing her all day. Like, I don't even want to say it. It's so disgusting to me. You know, like, ugh, with his hands. Just, like... Filling all up on this poor 11-year-old. He had already had a noose prepared, so he tied it around her neck over um, a sewer pipe. As he was taking her to put her, like, in the position, like, with the noose and stuff, he asked her for a camera. And she was like, I don't have one. And so she was like, what's going to happen to me? And he told her um, soon she would be in heaven with the others. Oh, my gosh. Yep. So he didn't, like, sexually penetrate her? No. So he put a gag in her mouth and then... Like, raised her with the noose to hang her. Yeah. Um, And then masturbated on her. Oh, my God. Bless it. Yep. Sorry. That, like, because I feel like she's the only kid. Well, I mean, obviously her brother, too. But they're the only kids. The rest are adults. And so, mm-hmm. I don't know. I, that just, it was like, that was his first killing that we know of, you know. And it was just this 11-year-old girl that he, like, I think one of the articles even said he was, like, transfixed with her. And that he said, <laughs> this quote aggravates me. I mean, not that the whole thing doesn't, but he said, I guess Hispanic people just turn me on. Ugh. <laughs> like, I want, like, what a creepy fuck. Yes. Ugh. Okay. So only just a couple of months later is when he claimed his second victim, well, technically his fifth victim, his second killing. Yeah. A few months later, on April 4th, 1974, is when he claimed his next victim, Catherine Bright. She was 21 years old. She was found stabbed in her home and then later died in the hospital. And I couldn't find a whole lot on her killing, 
other than Dennis Rader expressed that he was disappointed that he had to stab her instead of killing her because she fought back so hard. Oh, I'm sorry that it just, you know, didn't go ruined your, way. your plan. I know. Poor baby. So after he killed Catherine Bright, he went um, underground for about three years. Man, he was shook after that. He was like, uh, yes. fuck this. I got to watch more documentaries. I got to <laughs> of, you know. The other thing that I forgot to say about um, that I did find when he killed Catherine Bright is that her brother was actually home as well. And he shot her brother twice, but he survived. Oh, my goodness. Mm-hmm. And um, he described Dennis Rader as an average sized man um, with a bushy mu- uh, mustache and psychotic eyes. Mm. And sorry, let me backtrack again because I forgot something else about whenever he was killing Josephine and her whole family. When he left, he stole a watch and a radio. And like that would kind of later be his thing. Like he would the strangulation and then would keep a souvenir yeah. from the house. Um, Stupid trophies. So, like I said, he goes dormant with the killings. But in October of 1974, he places a letter in a public library book where he takes responsibilities for killing the Oteros family. So, Raider kind of fancied himself as, like, he just thought that he was this brilliant serial killer. And he really liked taunting the police and the public with these letters. And so, this was just the first letter of many. And so, the letter ended up getting to the local newspapers. You know, again, he thought he was just this genius person. And really, he wasn't. Like, there were so many grammatical errors in all of his letters. And um, just tons of errors and just everybody was like, uh, who's this guy? He said in the in this first letter that was in the um, library book, the code words for me will be bind them, torture them, kill them, BTK. So like he named himself, you know, yeah. like what a narcissist. <laughs> like, oh, guys, hey, I want you to write about me. And this is my name. Yeah. Can you call me BTK? Because that's what I want to be known as. <laughs> BTW, BTK. Call me BTK. <laughs> yes. And so then from there on, he became like BTK, BTK killer, whatever. So in March of 1977, he entered the home of Shirley Vian, who was sick at home with her three children. Oh, gosh. So he strangled Shirley to death. While her three kids were locked in the bathroom. Um, all the kids survived. Okay, good. Whew. I know. I know. Um, but he was, like, later when he's recounting his crimes with police, he talks about how angry he was that the kids got away. Oh, my gosh. Well, it's his fault. I know. I feel like I've read somewhere that something happened while he was killing her that, like, made him have to leave earlier than planned, which is why the kids survived. Ooh. Um, But I, of course, now that I'm telling the story, I can't find yeah. that. <laughs> well, thank God. God, that I know. the kid survived. I know. So that was in March. And then in December of that year is when he went into the home of Nancy Fox. All right. So Nancy Fox. Mm-hmm. He goes into her house and strangles her to death. And then he's the one that called the police to report the homicide. Oh, Lord. Yeah. And so, like, keep in mind, he was working for ADT at the time. And so he knew how to manage all of these security systems. He would pick houses that were on a corner lot so that he had multiple exit points. Oh, wow. To be able to get away and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. He was like incredibly calculated with how he would do it. All right. So the next month, January of 1978, he sent a poem to the local newspaper about the Shirley Vian or Vian. I think I say it differently every time about (laughs) killing her. Roses are red. Violets are blue. Carrie doesn't understand how to say Shirley Vian. I don't know. Do you? That's funny. Okay. Then several weeks after that, he sent a letter to a local television station listing off some of the people that he was responsible for killing, like Vian, Vian, whatever, Fox, and then another unknown victim. He was, again, thought that he was like this prolific serial killer that was a genius and all of that. So in the letter, he likened himself to... Ted Bundy and David Berkowitz, who is also known as Son of Sam. And so it's like, cool, you're cool. Yeah. uh, You're so great that you have to tell us that you're great and who you're like. That's how this works. He's like a bridezilla. Right. But again, he liked this kind of cat and mouse game with the authorities and, you know, sending these letters and, and all of that. 
Um, he sent the letter in January of 1978. In 1978 is when he and his wife also had their second child, which was a daughter. And then in 1979 is when he graduated from Wichita State University with a degree in administration of justice. Oh, wow. Isn't it ironic? <laughs> Don't you think? So he later left ADT and got a job basically with the city as like a dog catcher but he could like write tickets to people like if their lawn like if the grass was too thick or yeah. like, you know too tall or if they had parked too close to a curb or something like like he was ridiculous about how specific he was with the rules because he liked the power and the authority yes. and so if you park too you know again he would like get a ruler and oh measure people's lawns and like write them tickets for their grass being too tall yeah total jackass uh -huh. he was looking for that power mm -hmm. that he was getting from the killings in his everyday life yeah because again he would um in the killing like he didn't necessarily have sex with them but he would masturbate on them like that was his sexual release yeah i bet he didn't have to use two hands <laughs> <laughs> which is why he was compensating for his uh needing the power we should have been psychologists <laughs> needle dick <laughs> <laughs> what movie oh all i can hear is needle dick needle dick yeah <laughs> He's a what, what, water boy. In April of 1979, Dennis Rader entered an elderly woman's house. And oh, gosh. No, this one's okay. Okay. He waited and waited and waited, and she never came home, so he left. So he sent her a letter to tell her that BTK had been there. And oh that she, gosh. like, basically just missed Don. She was like, thank God bingo ran long. Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> um. But And that's like one of those things where shit like that happens and you're like, oh, God, I forgot something. I have to turn around and go get it. Yes. And it's like, but what did you miss happening? Yeah. Because you had to turn around because you, you know, whatever, something ran long or mm -hmm. you got stuck in traffic or whatever. Like, because, again, it really could have been something like she was being a ran late. She was stuck in traffic. She had to go back and because she forgot her to go box on the table at yeah, the restaurant, uh -huh. you know, like yeah. any of those things. And it's like, had she been home, she would have died. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And a gruesome death. And yes. Bond, torture, kill. Um, For 9-11, uh, one of the people I watched on Real World, because I used to watch that. Well, duh. Didn't we um, all? <laughs> yeah. She was from the New Orleans cast. Uh, This girl, she woke up late for that flight. Yeah. And so, like, everyone was calling her. And when she finally woke up, she's like, what, I'm okay? Yeah. You know? Oh, my gosh. Yep. Could you imagine? Had she? Yep. I know. Let's just give two high fives for running late. Okay. And now back to the killing. Okay. After that lady had gotten the letter, the police were, well, they were like, okay, look, he had called in that he had the homicide for Nancy Fox. Let's release the 911 tape and see if anybody recognizes his voice. Ooh. And they didn't. Aw. I know. <laughs> okay, so Raider goes dormant again for roughly six years. But then he came back with a vengeance. Oh, damn. This time, he has set his sights on his neighbor, Marine Hedge. He liked her hedges? Oh, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> so many things went through my mind. Oh, my God. That. All I could think about was her carpet. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> did they match the drapes? I was thinking, I mean, maybe he likes a nice bush. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's terrible. <laughs> okay, so just a little bit of information before I tell about how he killed Marine Hedge. So he was working, like I said, for the city as like a compliance supervisor is what he was. And so that's, you know, where I told you he would like measure people's lines. He would chase down stray animals, like holding like a um, tranquilizer gun. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yep. So he was really involved with his church. He was like president of his church council. Of course. I know, right? And then he also was like a Boy Scout troop leader. Always prepared. <laughs> Hence the tranquilizer gun. Right. I'm not going to hurt you, Scout's Honor. <laughs> Would you like some popcorn? <laughs> <laughs> so I did a really shitty job of organizing my notes. So sorry for the back and forth jumping. Okay, so when he entered her home, she was like super calm. And so he lied to her and was like, I'm just going to rape you. And so he tied her up. So she was like, all right, I'll go with it. Because, But you know what I mean? Like, because... 
Yeah, no, I'm to kind of like placate him and like yeah. to hopefully get away, you know. Yeah. So part of his MO was that he would tell some of his victims that he had sexual problems and um so he needed to do some bondage sex like with them. Oh my god. You would be like, I don't fucking care. It says that he would become aroused when he would, like, reveal his ruse to them. And so Nancy Fox was like, can I go to the bathroom before, like, we just get it over with kind of thing? I don't know. And he said, where you're going, you don't need the bathroom. Damn. But that, like, just get it over with may be his quote. So when she came out of the bathroom, he handcuffed her, threw her on the bed, and then strangled her. As she, like, recovered, because he paused for a minute, because, again, it takes a shit ton of strength. So as she recovered from him, uh, pausing, he said that he whispered in the ear that, like, he was BTK and that he was a bad guy. I'm a real bad guy. <laughs> like, I know. okay. Uh, clearly, you're fucking raping me, so <laughs> I didn't think you were a good one. Oh my god, I thought you were a Boy Scout. Oh my god, I thought this was a date. <laughs> said no one, ever. Right? You were so romantic. I really like your handcuffs. Oh my god, I wish you would have said, and I didn't wash my hands. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Okay. So he said that when she when he told her that he was BTK that like she really started squirming and so she he had to put a lot of pressure to kill her and so that got him so excited at that after she died he masturbated on her. Oh lord. When yep. when he goes into hiding, he really needs to pump the iron so that these poor people don't die and then sort of come back and then have to die right. again. Right. Yeah. And then that's where like his kind of like n- like narcissistic whatever came out because he that's when he called the police to report because they didn't find her fast enough so he's like you'll find a homicide at um 8 43 south pershing her name's nancy fox but he said homicide weird he said homicide instead of homicide and so they were like hmm so that's part of like why they released the tape because who the yeah. fuck says homicide Yeah. Because he's an idiot. But he just thought he was so fucking smart. And he's saying homicide and has all these, like, grammatical errors in his letters and stuff. Yeah. Well, because he was like, oh, I killed her at home. So it's a homicide. Ha ha. (laughs) I smart. (laughs) Oh, okay. Sorry. I forgot this, too. (laughs) I apparently should have, like, numbered my pages, numbered the sections of pair. I suck. Sorry. This okay. is our first podcast episode ever. <laughs> so one time he accidentally, because he was stupid, he, <laughs> what a dumbass, left, <laughs> accidentally left a draft of one of his letters that he was going to send to the police. He accidentally let us, left it out and his wife found it. <laughs> she was like, uh, the fuck? And he was like, because he was in school at the time. Because oh remember, he got his degree like yeah. after they were married and having kids. And he was like, oh, it's like a writing experiment for one of my classes. She said that one of his brothers was like, you spell just like BTK. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> because he's so fucking stupid. Oh, my God. <laughs> yep. So back to 1985 when he broke into Maureen Hedges' house. So this is where he gets a little more brazen because she just lives a couple houses down from him. So she had a male um, guy, a boy over. She had a date. Shit. <laughs> Like, <laughs> like a male escort? What am I saying? Yeah. So he broke into um Maureen Hedges' house and hid in her and hid in her closet. So when her little boyfriend left, he crept out of the closet, <laughs> flipped on her bedroom light. She sat up like the fuck is going yeah. on? And that's when he like pounced on her and strangled her to death. Literally. <laughs> I am messed up in the fucking head because all I can think about is him flipping on the light and being naked and like twirling his thing around like a helicopter. Just because that's your fantasy in life (laughs) does not mean it's Marine Head. (laughs) Maybe because you said Mel Escort. I know. And then you're like get a little Channing Tatum action happening in your head. (laughs) Oh, God. Yeah. Pony started playing right. Oh, (laughs) God. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, can we be serious about this murder? Yes, he just pounced kidding. on her. Like a fucking jackrabbit. Is that a thing? <laughs> yes. 
I'm like, did he just make up that? So after he strangled her to death, he placed her nude body into the trunk of his car and drove on down to the Christ Lutheran Church, where he was the president. So while they were in the church, he photographed her in a bunch of different, like, sexual bondage positions. Oh, my gosh. So he, like, had already placed black plastic sheets and stuff all over the church, knowing that he was going to be taking her dead body there. Wow. To take the photographs and stuff. Wow. His quote is that he took her body to the church so that he could have his way with her. Oh, my God. Mm-hmm. So he took all his pictures, did all the shit he wanted to do, and then he dumped her body in a ditch. Wow. Yeah. So that's, I feel like, the first, like, disposal of a body for him. Yeah. Time. So after he killed Maureen Hedge, he had two more victims, Vicki Wurgel and Dolores Davis. And Dolores Davis was killed on um, January 19th, 1991. So his killing spree Uh-oh. was from 1991. <clears throat> Del- Dolores was killed, um, like taken from her home and killed January 19th, 1991. So his killing spree was from 1974 to 1991. Wow. With nobody knowing, you know, who he was. Yeah. And so, again, all this time he had been, like, taunting police with the letters and, and all of that. Um. But again, they just, they didn't know who the hell he was. So, in early 2005, that's when he made his mistake that led to him getting caught. Um, He left a cereal box in the back of a stranger's pickup at a Home Depot. The owner of, yeah, so in the box, there was like letters and stuff to the police. Sorry. In the box, there was letters and stuff to the police. But the owner of the truck threw it away thinking it was just trash. (laughs) And so, (laughs) I mean, why would you be like, what the fuck is, you know what I mean? Yeah. Anyway, so Dennis Rader, being who he was, was like waiting and waiting and waiting and like (laughs) nothing's being said about the box I left. And so he contacted the news stations being like, "Um, what happened about the box you know, that I left in that truck. So police were able to track down the box and it was just filled with documents detailing like his murders and then ones that he planned to commit. In the box, one thing he asked the police, would the killer be able to communicate with the police via a floppy disk? What? Uh Uh-huh. In the note, he asked for the police to be honest. (laughs) as Check yes or no. Yes. To be like, could they catch him from that? So, of course, the police were like, no, we can't. (laughs) So, um, (laughs) if they agreed to, like, not catch him from this floppy disk, (laughs) they were to run an ad in the local classifieds. Oh, my God. (laughs) Yes. So I forget the message they had to say. Oh, and you know what? Let me back up a little bit. So he had communicated with the police and the media 11 times throughout the years. Wow. Yeah. And so he wrote some of his communications like in, and I'm doing air quotes here, book form because he's an idiot. Oh, my um, And he would label them as like chapters. So he was so stupid. <laughs> no. <laughs> he was so cocky that he would hide words in like word puzzles in the communication oh with gosh. police. And I mean, he's not smart. He hid his last name. In one of the puzzles. <laughs> yep. And so, again, because he was, you know, too impatient, he named the communication via the cereal box Rice Crispy Box Communique. <laughs> And then, again, the quote from the note was, Can I communicate with Floppy and not be traced to the computer? Be honest. (laughs) (laughs) And so, yeah, here it is. In the note, he told police, like, if it was untraceable for the police to put an ad in the classifieds (laughs) and the the predetermined code was Rex, it will be okay. (laughs) I can't with this guy. I could write with him because he would be a freaking hilarious. He, you would spend 14 minutes trying to decipher what he meant in a sentence with so many grammatical errors. No, he would probably speak my language. True, true, true. <laughs> okay, so because he was like, sweet, I can communicate with them via a floppy disk. They won't know what's going on. <laughs> so 
He was at his Lutheran church, and he told the pastor he had to go, like, print off some meeting minutes. So instead, he put his little floppy disk in, printed off some documents, did did this, whatever he had to do. And so what happens, of course, it embeds on the floppy, like, the username and location yeah. and all that crap. All that tech stuff I don't understand. Except I know that it's traceable. Yes. So when the police get the floppy disk, of course, they trace it to the church and it's like a basic internet search shows that he's the president of the the church so now they have his name so not only did they have his name now from the lutheran church so they knew who he was and so they go back to the home depot security cameras and are like that's him oh put in the box in the truck (laughs) so then they're like okay so he masturbated at every single crime scene so we have tons of dna evidence it's 2005 now right so the police retrieve a DNA sample from his daughter. (gasps) Sidebar, her name is Carrie Rawson, and she spells it just like me. Whoa. There's no one ever in the history of the world that spells their name like me (laughs) because my parents chose to spell my name ridiculous. Yep. Isn't that crazy? I didn't even know that any part about his daughter turning him in, actually, or like being part of the DNA sample, much less we had the same name and much less it was spelled the same. Right. Anyway, so they get a DNA sample from his daughter and prove that it's him this whole time. So his daughter was kind of kept a a closed lip about everything, like wouldn't talk to the media, that sort of thing. He was convicted of the 10 murders. So he was arrested on February 25th of 2005. In an interview with police, I love this, it says he was stunned and dismayed that detectives would lie to him about being tracked on the floppy disk. (laughs) They promised me. I said be honest. They (laughs) lied. (laughs) Okay, so during his trial... um, Um, On June 27, 2005, he gave this really long and graphic confession detailing all 10 of the murders that he committed between 1974 and 1991. He was given 10 life sentences for each one of his victims um, in August of 2005. And at the time this article was written, he's 72 years old. He's in solitary confinement awaiting to die in prison. Wow. Yes. So his daughter said that really kind of what did it in for her with him was when she realized, you know, it's him and then... That he killed someone so close to them, not only in you know physical proximity yeah. of the neighbor, but in their life, you know? Yeah. Oh, and she said, too, that whenever he killed Nancy Fox, her mother was three months pregnant with her. And so she's just, like, has so much guilt for her and her mom and being alive. And they got to live when all these women died. You know, she was like, my dad got to walk me down the aisle. And he should have been in prison since 1974 kind of thing. Yeah. Just to kind of highlight his ridiculously overconfidence and narcissistic personality disorder. Because I think I'm a psychologist and diagnosed him. He says that he has what he calls factor X. I think you've probably heard this before that he says that like all like the notorious serial killers again he compares himself to son of sam and ted bundy and all these people and he says that they all have this factor x that makes them kill and they can't control it so basically he should be let out of prison because he can't control it because factor x. i don't know about the left out of prison i don't know about the prison thing i made that part <laughs> up but he did do the factor x and so you know it just if it wasn't because he had you know he would go years in between killings and so it was like you know did he die did he go to prison who is this guy yeah um that had he not been so such a complete narcissist and have to have that communication with police and have to send, you know, the letters to the media and all that, he would have never been caught. Right. They had no idea. I mean, because, yeah, they had DNA eventually, you know, because yeah. he left DNA everywhere because it was the 70s and who even knew what that was. But right. they would have had no, I mean, they had no reason to even collect his DNA until he sent the floppy. Yeah. So had he not had to have that communication, had to be in the limelight, had to be, you know. Had to be with the times. Like, he could have just kept with the paper. I know. I know. But no, he was like, I'm super smart and I have an Apple computer. (laughs) Well, yeah. And then like he, I feel like he left the notes in like these obscure places, like a book in the library. Yes. Some trash in the back of somebody's truck. But what are you, what are you talking about? (laughs) Like, you know? Yeah. And so he puts it in these places where it's taken people a long time to find it. And then he gets aggravated because nobody's finding it and so that you know it's just like this vicious cycle of him needing to be in the spotlight and blah 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 (laughs) i know he's so crazy you know i remember when it was a big media thing about the btk killer being caught yeah yeah we were sophomores in college yeah i remember that but at the time it wasn't a big deal to me like like how the um 
Easter rapist is a big yeah. deal today. Yeah. yeah. But it's like the same thing. It's the same thing. thing. Yeah, it really is. That's cool. I didn't even put that together that that came out today and then I did the story today. Because, I mean, I've been knowing I was doing him for like a week now. But yeah. So, yeah. So that's BTK. He was, I think, one of my, like, he was one of the first serial killers that I was like, okay, I remember his name. I remember what BTK stands for. You yeah. know, like, because I just suck at remembrance. <laughs> so, and clearly organizing my notes. That is too funny. We forgive you, Carrie. I know. I, and I feel like, too, sometimes I skim over, not skim over, but I my stories focus more on like us kind of talking about the stuff at the end, like his narcissism and the letters and all that. But I don't, I mean, I want to pay homage to the victims, but I also don't want to spend so much time on how they died and like the gruesome details that it detracts from them, you know, yeah. and put so much focus on him or the killer and you know what I mean? Yeah. No, I totally get that. So I feel like I could have done that story very differently. I like the why more than the how. Yeah, I get that. So that's BTK, which stands for? Bind, torture, kill. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I feel like womp womp right now. <laughs> Why? Like, I feel like we ended, like, it. I don't know. It's just like a... Somber? Som- yeah, somber. Like, can we go back to him being a moron and not that he killed people? <laughs> so, what did we learn? One, when an old soul comes and tells you that there are dead bodies on your property, believe him. Yes, don't dig them up. Nope. That was my number two. Oh, well, yeah. Don't disturb graves by (laughs) digging them for a fucking swimming pool. Although we all want a swimming pool. Yeah. Unless you're on HGTV and you fucking feel that shit and that's stupid. Uh, Three, always check cereal boxes. If you didn't put your trash in the back of your truck, (laughs) someone else may have. Yep. So check it. Unless you think it's a bomb and then don't check it. (laughs) And four. Three's a really good round number and we should be there. Yeah, that's it. (laughs) (laughs) Although it's not a round. Whatevs. Exit, cancel, cut that. Okay, so go check out our friends at the Haunted Heart Podcast. They are awesome and they're hilarious. You'll love them just like we do. Yes, they are so fucking funny. Mm -hmm. Yes, they are. Could I say yes, yes, yes again? (laughs) Now I know what she sounds like in bed. (laughs) Shit. may have just blushed from that (laughs) it takes a lot i feel like to make me blush and that did uh well that means it's true folks (laughs) marley so we hope that this episode makes your monday a little bit brighter and remember creep it real and and don't don't get scared. scared